and part of that is, if, for those of you that books know that when you read it, there was all kinds of like things sparking in your imagination about the animals, right? All the creatures, the spaces he described. That you're like, I would like to know more about that animal, Creaturepedia. Uh, and and so what we wanted to do too, and I actually had this colleague conversation, which I think you would agree with. If not, feel free to disagree with me publicly. Mm -hmm. um, is why not make it like Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings? Why not make it like Harry Potter? Live action, big, all that sort of stuff. Well. One of the things we talked about early on is that it's really um, um, interesting in art when art is invitational to your imagination, right? Where it presents an, an image, Miyazaki does this beautifully, where it invites you to engage your imagination to imagine details that are not there, right? You're kind of wrestling with it. Some of the modern things in animation, and certainly in you know, certain live action films, is it gives you all that specificity on screen not requiring your imagination. Do you understand? So the filmmaker has imagined it for you, you participate. Um, what we were hopeful to do, and why we then leaned more towards animation, and then the, the key choices we made along the process of developing this was, how can we continue to engage your imagination in the same way that the books did, right? So that you're curious about, well, what was that thing that you inferred in the design, but it's not all there for me, um, and that the, the world extends beyond the edge of the frame. Um, that's very intentional choices. Some people got frustrated by that, like, well, why isn't it, you know, uh, sharper or more detailed. Well, that's what others are doing. We're intentionally saying, no, we're going to let you uh, explore in your imagination. Does that make sense? So, you go. Yeah. Where are you off to? Uh, or do you want to I just have another thing I got to do. Yeah, thanks. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Exploring. Uh, thanks for coming, you guys. These guys are wonderful. Hey, hey so I Joel, at the end of our session, we're going to make the announcement about what we're doing right now. Ooh. <laughs> Maybe I'll stay. No. <laughs> <laughs> So, anyways, all that said, in comes Nicholas Cole, and Nicholas Cole was met with a bunch of things that we had actually already worked on. We had another really great artist uh, named Pat, who had done some work on what liquid might look like uh, when we were actually first working with Kickstarter. Um, and he's this really accomplished artist that I'd hired a number of times, great guy. And um, this kind of art and, and a few other uh, character things uh, very quickly told us things we would not want to do. I know that sounds kind of perhaps rude, but it's, it was things that we decided, oh no, let's not do. One of those is we're not doing any Tudor uh, style. Uh, that had been done a bunch. We um, uh, had character designs that were great, but we ultimately developed those further. Some of you guys saw some of these during the Kickstarter campaign. These were things that Tom Owens developed. He would tell you, I'm not a character designer, but uh, as we were kind of exploring the story, he started drafting up with these kids. And you can see some of the rooting that, that Nicholas ultimately took and, and developed further. Um, so this was really the toolbox that when we met Nicholas, we said, all right, here's what we have, here's what we've been thinking about, where to next? And then we began with the characters. Yeah. Yeah, well, I wanted to jump off sort of what Andrew was just saying um, about the process of adaptation, which is sort of the bringing into focus of this entire thing. And um, what's interesting about uh, writing and reading uh, is that it's kind of um, a little bit like echolocation. You have these things, and you have one word, and then you're kind of drifting in your own imagination until you hit the next word, the next descriptor, the next fact, you know? And you can fill in that in-between space with all of this imagination, your own emotions, where you are at the time, and what you're bringing to it. Um, if I say the word dog, you're all going to imagine a different dog. Um, and if I say nugget, I uh, guarantee you we all have different ideas of who nugget is and what nugget looks like in our heads based on the experience we have reading. Um, so the task of adapting that to a visual medium is uh, pretty dicey and a little bit uh, scary because it's it, it's one of stewardship and so there's all this work that's been done there's a illustrative work for the books that's been done by people like Jeff Sutphin and um, and others <laughs> um, and Tom Owens uh, already sort of laying some groundwork there um, and realizing that when I came into the project I came sort of a bit late and a bit green and a bit sort of like just I had never heard of this world I had never heard of these people uh, I came uh, very ready to learn as much as I could, as quickly as I could. And when I got an email from Chris, it dropped a couple names in it, uh, just randomly. And, and those were echolocative as well. They were just these little pings on my radar, and it was like uh, C.S. Lewis, Shige Chesterton, Hayao Miyazaki, and I think you probably dropped The Princess Bride or whatever. Princess and I was like, I am listening now. You know? <laughs> um, you had my attention, and uh, and I knew nothing about the Wingfeather Saga, and I knew nothing about Hutch Moon, and they knew that too. And so, 
there was a, a very tentative kind of approaching of each other, uh, kind of cautiously, like, who are you? Are you cool? Who, you know, what is this? I'm a Christian, you're a Christian, what kind of Christian are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, is this going to suddenly flip and turn extremely, you know, preachy, or is it not going? It's just going to go the other way and abandon the core principles that we know we, we now hold very much in common. Um, and so the the slow discovery was interesting. And so the first thing we decided to do was they Chris told me basically dig into these books. These are what these are. Here are these pinging little things that sort of help you get an idea of what this is about. And then we just love if you'd read it. Um, and then the next step was to take swing at the characters. So if you actually bring up the next step. Yep. So that was my first sort of task was to sort of dig into this thing, take what I was seeing from the sketches that Tom had already provided and kind of the material they sent over, read the books, and just kind of get my first ideas down. And like anybody who's talking about writing in this conference will tell you your first uh, draft is, is your worst draft and it's, it's, it's the raw material that you're going to build this thing out of. Um, and that's super, super true of anything visual and illustrative and su super true of design stuff. You know, you're just kind of, uh, for lack of a better term, vomiting those like first ideas just hulk sail onto the page. It's like, okay, I don't know, maybe pitchfork, I don't know, maybe it's uh, jeans and floppy boots and um, all these different influences are sort of colliding and bouncing off each other and you're just trying to get an idea based on what you've just read. But I started that first chapter and I was in hook, line, and sinker. Um, there was something so familiar about this world to me and it was so warm and so, it just felt very right. And I felt like as a character designer, I'm a, I, I, I fit into different tasks with various levels of uh, success, you know. Um, I just came off work for, I did some Spyro the Dragon work, some of you may know what that is, some, some probably not, Crash Bandicoot's another character I'm working with. These characters were, I'm having to do a lot of work to remember how I felt about that in 1998 when that originally came on the scene. I'm having to even imagine, imagine what it's like to be a fan of that so I can serve those fans well by adapting something that I don't particularly care for. That was not the case with this, um, and that was what was really interesting and, and powerful for me was that immediately I felt myself becoming a fan. Um, and that's a bit dangerous too because now now it's precious to me as well as to the audience. Um, and the stewardship of that thing is like, no, oh, now I gotta get this right. You know, like I can't just phone this in, I can't just, you know, kinda check these boxes. Now I really care that Calmore feels like Calmore. Yeah. You know, now I really care that Janner, when he's on the screen, like looks like Janner in my head and Janner in your head. And that's terrifying. Your heads are terrifying. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, heaven forbid, everybody should like get on Reddit afterwards and tell us what you really think. Because that happens <laughs> on plenty of projects. But um, so one by one, we started to sort of bring these characters into focus, realizing that I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, just as we all are in adapting this stuff, trying to steward it faithfully. And as Chris mentioned in the design, uh, there's there's a word, right? You have Poto, for instance, and you have this character who's, a, who's the grandfather, so immediately your head, you're, you're, you're doing the imaginative work of, okay, who do I think of when I think of grandpa? And then Andrew gives you peg leg later on in a paragraph down the line, you know, and you're like, oh, whoa, now I have to revisit that imagination and take a leg away. Um, <laughs> And then which leg is important? You have to kind of work on that. Oh my gosh, that seriously. was such a thing. <laughs> this became so complicated uh, because we wanted to do some things with, um, you'll note Lily, of course, and Poto share the, that they both have a lame leg or missing in this case. But, and we wanted that to be similar. And it, there was a whole production issue around this that we had to fix. But and then that. there's the, the, the addition to you on them. As you're bringing this into to focus, you've got, now all I have is like a grandfatherly face and a, there's no leg here. And all of this in between, I have no idea what, what goes there yet. Um, and as you visually discover that, I'm realizing, okay, pirate, ex-pirate, like, I want tattoos immediately. And, and as a visual person, maybe Andrew didn't lay that down explicitly in the text, but now I'm thinking, oh, wouldn't it be fun if? And that's dangerous when you're adapting and stewarding work. Um, the rule of cool is something we talk about a lot um, in the process of this, this sort of development, which is just to say that if it's cool, it winds up in the final product, and the end winds up just being a collection of the coolest things everyone could think of. Um, 
And that's not what we wanted to do. And so it wasn't just photo had tattoos that would be sick, you know, and like an earring, and he'd have like a cool jacket, and like it, it just goes, it spirals out of control. Um, but at this juncture, I would say one of the other things that came in in design that we were talking about was the influence of steampunk, um, and we were, that was another big no-no, like we weren't going to do Tudor, and we weren't going to do any steampunk, that's, they were off our list, so uh, his character certainly could lend that way, um, yeah. and we actually did a version of Lily with a, a really cool braced leg instead of a cane because it would be easier for animation. <laughs> um, and it looked awesome in a steampunk kind of way, but we obviously went back to this. So there was just all these little opportunities to um, add. And, and the key thing was, and one of the things that we just came out of this talk, uh, Andrew and a couple of the other authors here gave about struggle and about writing. And one of the suggestions was to have this like core tenet, sort of a touchstone that you all went back to and you, this story is about loss, you know, and everything I'm gonna do and every decision I'm gonna make in writing has to check back to that original core principle. And whether that's part of Andrew's writing process or not, that needs to be a part of the process of adapting this visually because we don't have the, the whole world Andrew does in his head in ours yet. And then we have to coordinate all of these different people adapting it and making it together. And so, uh, Chris helped and, and Andrew in a big way sort of hold down those tent poles of like, no, this is who Poto is, you know? And if it starts to skew too far one way or too far the other way, uh, we need to come back to that core. While also saying, we're defining these characters. Andrew would tell you, if he was still in the room here, that especially, especially in book one, he was finding the characters. And all of us that have read it realized they become sharper and much more definitive as the books went forward. Um, and so as such, uh, we knew our big challenge was mm -hmm. thinking about the story we were going to tell ultimately in this first short film, we're having to shape characters that didn't exist in the first book in the way that they would exist later. Um, there was a famous bit where um, we got a draft of our, our script for that short film from these really great writers, and, and it was this one ridiculous moment in which Janner said, you're not my dad, you can't tell me what to do, to Poto. And, and Andrew's like, that's awful. What, who, the guys, like, I feel like you don't even know who Jenner is. Like, he would never do that, and that's not who Poto is. And they went, it's on page 23 of the book. <laughs> <laughs> and Andrew's like, oh, you know. uh, and, and he would tell you, he was finding those characters as he was writing that first book, and they got their voice, you know, obviously as the book developed. So we, but we have to, like, uh, compensate for that, because we're building a foundation for these characters that has to carry through the four books, or through the four, you know, stories we're gonna tell. And, um, you know, so there's adjustments being made along the way. Uh, a lot of Laura Hiddle over here, uh, where we go, hey Laura, help us. <laughs> you are the librarian of all things. Um, and finding out what do we know about these characters. Uh, I, at one point, Aiden helped us build a, a, a deeper family tree with ages and histories and all this type, trying to really understand all these characters at a much deeper level, like what their favorite food is, like really do all that kind of character study. Um, so that we could have common uh, choices, you know, not just uh, inferred ones. In other words, I read the book and I see the character this way. And on a team like this, we all have to agree upon, settle in on, okay, what are those things we're all gonna agree that we think you all will want to agree about the characters? Does that make sense? So that's what a lot of this was doing here. Should we move on to first painting? 